Well, thanks so much, Casey. And uh, thanks for the invitation to come speak with you uh, virtually today. So hopefully you can all hear me and see my slides. And uh, I have the chat window open in case uh, there's any technical issues that you need to get in contact with me. So um, as Casey said, I am uh, the director of a new NSF funded institute, the Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions. And what I thought I would do in this colloquium is tell you a little bit of a story about how this institute started from my personal perspective and tell you about this topic of weak supervision for the strong force marrying together ideas coming from the machine learning world with ideas coming from uh, quantum field theory and the standard model. Um, just as an advertisement, uh, here's the logo for our institute. You can see that depending on how you read it, it's a uh, either a capital A with a lowercase i on top of it or a capital F with, uh, with an i next to it, these twin meanings of artificial intelligence and fundamental interactions. And what we're trying to do in the Boston area is to infuse physics intelligence into artificial intelligence and develop machine learning that's incorporating first principles, best practices, and domain knowledge from fundamental physics with the goal both of advancing our knowledge of physics itself and searching for new phenomena beyond the standard model, for example, but also galvanizing AI research innovation with the idea that some of the tools that we build in the physics context are relevant um, uh, also outside of our specific domain. So you're having a school right now, so I hear that you've had uh, already some uh, great lectures by, by David, and you're going to be hearing from Gregor, and I guess uh, Sunhawk is, is giving you some tutorials, so that's fantastic. Uh, in the Boston area, we're doing our own summer school and workshop uh, in, in August, where probably some of the very same themes are going to be coming up there. Uh, but again, what I want to do today is tell you how I changed my mind. I was very much a machine learning skeptic. I was, uh, didn't really understand how machine learning could help me understand fundamental physics and how I now am an evangelist. I think that this is one of the most exciting things going on and it's great that you're learning about this in this summer school this week. So the title of my talk is Weak Supervision for the Strong Force. And I like to think about this as an iFi origin story. So, you know, how did this AI Institute get uh, to be? How did I become director of this? And in a very real sense, it started with two of my former graduate students, Patrick Kaminsky and Eric Matodia, coming to my office at MIT, telling about this cool paper that they were, wrote with uh, Matt Schwartz at Harvard um, as part of their master's work. And they were using techniques from convolutional neural networks, image processing, and using it to tell the difference between quark jets and gluon jets, which I'll review to you uh, what those uh, phenomena are. They came into this office very proud of this paper. and. I was not impressed. Uh, and what I said to them was, well, what do you mean by quarks and gluons? Um, and this might seem like a, like a straightforward uh, uh, question to answer. Um, after all, quarks and gluons are some of the fundamental ingredients in the standard model of particle physics. So what's so hard about answering that? But around the same time that Patrick and Eric wrote this paper in 2017, I was really thinking from a theoretical perspective what the meaning of quark and gluon was a very fundamental physics question. How do you define what you mean by a quark or a gluon at the level of the things that you actually see in your detector? And after this work, five years later, and in some sense, Patrick and Eric's PhD thesis work, five years later, I, I finally know an answer. And the punchline of this story is going to be this plot on the left-hand side, which is a decomposition of jets into quark and gluon components in a way where it's fully driven by the data. It's using machine learning techniques, data-driven techniques, and you don't need to um, assume ahead of time that you know what quarks and gluons are. The data will tell you uh, about it for you. So um, what's interesting about this plot is just how many things are coming from the machine learning world. Uh, weak supervision, which is in the title, uh, techniques called topic modeling, permutation variant networks, simulation-based inference tools, optimal transport, a whole suite of machine learning tools some of which that you're learning about this week today, but being used to address a quite fundamental question. What, are we, what is a quark? What is a gluon? Um, and how do I define it in a way that is rigorous and robust in the context of quantum field theory? So this is the story that I'm going to tell you today. And this is a story that's going back in time. Uh, so I'm going back to 2017. So what I'm going to be showing you is not you know, state-of-the-art machine learning stuff. This is really, in some sense, the simple things. Uh, how we can take this quark gluon conundrum. I'll try to explain to you what this issue is. Then leveraging this technique of weak supervision, and I'll try to explain why you have this cute koala reading a book uh, as the graphic. And then uh, 
you know, these could turn into, you know, a whole series of lectures if I was uh, at your school, uh, but just in the purpose of this colloquium, uh, giving you kind of a lightning montage going from 2019 to today, revisiting the strong force through the lens of machine learning. And what I want you to take away from this talk is that we can really address key principles in a rigorous way with the aid of machine learning. Machine learning is a tool that's very powerful for data analysis, but it's also a tool that's powerful for us thinking about the posing of our problems and being rigorous in the way that we try to address questions um, in and beyond the standard model. Okay, so let me try to explain to you first uh, this quark gluon conundrum. And let me just remind you uh, some of the things that you've already been learning about, about particle physics. Um, and this is kind of a particle physics 101 from the perspective of colliders. So you've probably seen this pie chart showing uh, all the various fundamental ingredients in the standard model of particle physics. The quarks shown in orange, the lepton shown in green, the force carriers in blue, and the Higgs boson, uh, now 10 years old, at the center of the standard model. Um, what may not be so obvious is that we don't see these ingredients directly when we do particle physics experiments. Very few of these ingredients are actually ones that we can probe uh, in a direct way. Rather, we only see their indirect imprints. So there are three particles that we can more or less see directly. So those are the ones that carry primarily electromagnetic interactions or only electromagnetic interactions. So that's photons, electrons, and muons. Those are particles that actually hit our detector and can be reconstructed. But then uh, the quarks and the gluons, you don't actually see those directly because of the confinement from the strong force. Quarks and gluons are bound together into composite states that are given these funny Greek names. So pions, kaons, and of course, protons, these are bound states of, of quarks and gluons. And so part of the question about how you define quarks and gluons is that you never actually see a quark or a gluon independently. You only see it in this bound structure. So because of that, how would you ever, uh, in, a, in a rigorous way, disentangle them? The other ingredients in the standard model, uh, 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 for example, decay very quickly. So Higgs boson top quark, W and Z decay relatively quickly. The tau lives a little bit longer, but also decays um, before it hits your detector. Neutrinos kind of sail through your detector. So most of the things that we see, sorry, most of what we need to do in particle physics rather is do inference tasks. We have to infer what's actually going on at short distances, infer that from what we see in our collision debris. And it's a really challenging problem. And inference is something that machine learning does really well. And that's the reason why machine learning shows up in many tasks in, uh, in particle physics. And every 25 nanoseconds at the Large Hadron Collider, we have collision events that look like this, where we don't even see these photons, electrons, muons, pions, them directly. Rather, we see their, uh, their signatures in terms of the various uh, detector elements, trackers, electromagnetic calorimetry, hadronic calorimetry, muon systems. And somehow we have to synthesize all this information to get our best guess of what's going on at short distances in these collisions. And the focus of, of my research program um, is understanding these collimated sprays of particles called jets. These jets arise from the fragmentation of quarks and gluons. So at short distances, there was secretly a little quark or a little gluon in here that was produced at high energy. But all you see are the bound states. You only see mostly the pions and kaons that are coming from the production of that quark and gluon. You don't get, have a unambiguous label saying, hey, this is a quark, this is a gluon. And this is a fascinating data science problem. We have jets all over the place, these collimated sprays of particles. Sometimes they come from quarks, sometimes they come from gluons, sometimes they come from more exotic objects. How do you actually figure out what's going on? And machine learning is a really powerful strategy for taking and synthesizing all the information from a collision event and figuring out what's, what's happening. The challenge is though, when you're applying machine learning, you have to know what you're actually trying to solve, what problem you're trying to solve. And one very basic task that you'd like to do is to say, if I see one of these jets, what was this jet coming from in terms of the fundamental standard model ingredients? This particular jet most likely comes from a top quark. In fact, on the other side, you could see here this kind of characteristic three-prong structure, which is characteristic of the, of the top quark. But for some of these other radiation patterns, you know, what are they? Are they quarks? Are they gluons? Are they something else? And more importantly, what do we mean by a quark jet versus a gluon jet? At the level of the standard model Lagrangian, the quark carries color charge. It's transforming as a triplet under SU3. The gluon is transforms in the adjoint. This is the force carrier for the strong force. It transforms as an octet. These have non-trivial transformation properties, but because of confinement, the constituents of a jet are color singlet hadrons. 
And so just by the, uh, the, the labeling in terms of representations of the SU3 color group, there really is no unambiguous way of telling the difference between a quark jet and a gluon jet. The quantum number that you would use, for example, quarks are fermions, quarks are color triplets, gluons are spin one bosons or color octets. You can't see any of that because of confinement. And at the same time that Patrick and Eric and Matt Schwartz were writing this paper about using machine learning to tell the difference of quarks and gluons, I was uh, party, participating in a study in the mountains of Les Jus, where we got a bunch of people together to argue about what we mean by a quark jet versus a gluon jet. And you know, this is this slide uh, that uh, was making the rounds in, in 2017 that I made from the most ill-defined concept to the most well-defined concept. And so ill-defined is saying, you know, what is a quark? Well, a quark is a quark parton, but that doesn't mean anything, or it's a born level quark parton, or the initiating quark parton in a final state shower, and so on and so forth. And at the bottom of this, what we decided in 2017 is that the most rigorous definition that we could give for a quark jet is this awful hand, uh, mouthful. And we defined it as a phase space region as defined by an unambiguous hadronic fiducial cross-section measurement that yields an enriched sample of quarks as interpreted by some suitable but fundamentally ambiguous criterion. This is a very scary sentence. And remarkably, you know, we kind of wrote this sentence almost jokingly, like, okay, try to come up with a way of actually satisfying this criteria, but this is something that's totally well-defined, but no one knows how to implement. And somehow miraculously, machine learning is a technique that actually gives you precisely what's in this green box here. It gives you a well-defined notion of what a quark or a gluon is. And that's what I'm gonna be showing you in this talk. So let me just emphasize the challenge, just emphasize why this is so difficult. So when I'm slamming together protons at the LHC, I make various final states, including quarks and gluons in the final state. Those quarks and gluons carry color charge. Um, and just like electrically charged objects radiate photons, color charged objects radiate gluons. And the way that they radiate gluons is via uh, the famous altarelli Parisi splitting kernel, this is a core prediction of QCD that basically says, if you give me a, a high energy quark or gluon, what is the radiation pattern of soft gluons and collinear gluons coming off of it? So this, um, this uh, splitting function says, okay, if I wanna know how likely is it for me to eject a gluon, it's proportional to alpha S, which is the strong coupling constant. So as I adjust the, the, the coupling strength, that would mean that higher coupling strength is a bigger propensity to have an emission. It's proportional to the color charge. So color charge is the uh, SU3 analog of electric charge. For quarks, that number is four thirds. For gluons, that number is three. Four thirds is less than three. So quarks radiate less than gluons. And in fact, quarks and gluons are primarily distinguished by their color charge. It's quite difficult to figure out uh, the spin of it directly. Um, it's the color charge, it's the quantum number that gives you the most distinguishing power of it. And then if you wanna know which direction this gluon is emitted, there's these two singularities, uh, d theta over theta, dz over z. So theta is the opening angle. And because this goes like one over theta, you primarily wanna have theta be small. So you have emissions that are collimated uh, at, at the small angle. So that gives you this jet-like cone-like behavior. And then dz over z, z is the uh, fraction of momentum that, that this gluon is carrying. Uh, it goes like one over z. And so this also wants to be uh, small. So you have relatively low energy uh, gluons emitted. And this, uh, this spray of collimated low energy gluons where the amount of them is proportional to what color you have uh, to begin with from the quark or gluon, that's in some sense the field theoretic defining characteristic of what a quark or gluon is. This would be great if we could see that directly. We can't see that directly because the strong force confines things. So I get these composite hadrons, I get pions and kaons, and then it gets smeared even further by, by hitting your detector. And you know, we can use machine learning to try to invert this process and try to go from what I'm seeing at the detector level and try to infer what's going on at short distances. Um, and this is in indeed one of the promises of machine learning. But from a fundamental perspective, because of this, this, uh, this confinement, I don't get to see directly this radiation pattern of quarks or gluons. I only get to see the resulting spray of pions. And how do I use machine learning or machine learning inference to invert this process when it is in some sense fundamentally ill-defined? Now there are some things that are well-defined. And so there's a whole other talk that I could give about this object that's called the energy flow uh, operator. This is something that's super well-defined in theory. It's robust to hadronization, robust to detector effects. It's based on the stress energy tensor. I have some backup slides if people are interested about this. 
But this is an object that's blind to direct quark and gluon information. This is an object that you can compute uh, quite accurately. There's been some heroic calculations um, in this site block here. But this is actually something that's relatively insensitive to quark and gluon information. So we want to do the complement of that, something that has quark and gluon information in there more directly. And um, another thing that's going to appear in this talk is that I'm going to be showing you results uh, using public data from the CMS experiment. Uh, this is an amazing uh, 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 resource for our field where the CMS experiment at the LHC made available to anyone, including theoretical physicists, uh, data that one could analyze in whatever way you wanted to. And so uh, with a group of folks, uh, including uh, 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 Tripathi, uh, Zhu, uh, Larkovsky, Marzani, uh, we all uh, got together and did an analysis, uh, taking collider events, finding jets, finding their substructure, computing a particularly interesting observable that is uh, related to this DZ over Z. So this kind of shape where things uh, uh, rocket up towards zero. Uh, this shape is a, 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 an avatar, if you'd like, of the one over Z behavior. But this is a colorblind test of QCD. It happens to be the first ever analysis using public LHC data. We did this also in 2017, so a lot was going on in 2017, but it's insensitive to quark and gluon composition. Uh, and this is not what I wanted to do at the time. I wanted to disentangle quarks and gluons. This is something that couldn't tell the difference between quarks and gluons. And so by this point in 2017, we were of this uh, opinion, which, I'm, I, which is still true. You know, jets are manifestations of quarks and gluons. This has been known since the 1970s. But there is no unambiguous way to tell a quark jet from a gluon jet. And that's still true today. There's no unambiguous way to tell a quark jet from a gluon jet. However, machine learning gives us a really powerful way of distinguishing a quark jet versus a gluon jet. And that's what I want to tell you about next. OK, so now that was 2017. Hopefully, you have some sense of this challenge of distinguishing quark versus gluon objects and understand the mental state that I was in in 2017. And then 2018 comes around, and 2018 is when I started to be converted from a machine learning skeptic into a machine learning believer. And um, we're going to be talking about weak supervision in a moment, but before we talk about weak supervision, I want to uh, introduce a different concept, and that's the concept that's known as blind source separation. So blind source separation is basically like doing linear algebra but doing linear algebra where you don't really know the uh, components that you're trying to uh, do rotations on. So this appears actually in cosmological data sets where you, know, you take a picture of the sky and uh, from that picture of the sky in microwave, your goal is to get the baby picture of the universe, the cosmic microwave background. But when you're actually looking at it in the sky, you don't just see the cosmic microwave background, you see all sorts of contaminating sources you see galaxies, you see clusters of galaxies, you see various galactic effects like dust, you see detector noise. And what you want to do is you want to separate out all these various components that are being mixed together when you're making your measurement, and you want to decompose them into their individual uh, pieces. So again, this is called blind source separation. It appears in cosmology, and the way that it's done, roughly speaking, is you take pictures of the sky at multiple different frequencies, you assert that each uh, sky map is a linear combination of the things that you're trying to disentangle. And then there's a, to my mind, almost magical uh, uh, blind source separation uh, algorithms that are able to disentangle things. And that forms one of the uh, tools that we use, for example, to pull out the cosmic microwave background. And again, it's called blind because you don't necessarily know uh, what each of the components are. You need to make some assumptions, um, but you're trying to make as few assumptions as possible to try to pull out this image. So this is something that's used in cosmology. And I started hearing about this. And you know, one question that you would ask is, could you use blind source separation for quark and gluon jets? Could you say, well, you can't unambiguously label individual jets. You can't say, this is a quark jet, this is a gluon jet. Um, you can't do that because this hadronization uh, and this confinement means that you're, you've lost that information. Nevertheless, the hope is that you might be able to extract quark and gluon distributions from hadron level measurements. So you can make measurements at the hadron level. That's like taking a picture of the cosmic microwave background with all its contamination and the multiple components. And then do this blind source separation, this fancy linear algebra, to separate things out into its pieces. And um, in natural language processing, this technique is known as, as topic modeling. Um, and I'm happy to tell you more about topic modeling if you're interested. Uh, but the reason why I'm, I'm showing you this representation in terms of like documents is that 
if you try to translate the natural language processing technique of topic modeling into what you would do in terms of uh, collider physics, it's like you have a, uh, a paper that paper's words are various quark and gluons. And then you have a histogram that tells you the, uh, the, how often you get different words in your dictionary. And if you have enough different types of documents, you can pull these things apart in order to get separate uh, quark and gluon uh, distributions. And again, and this appears in, uh, in natural language processing. And it's been used, for example, um, to take all the papers that are on the archive and try to disentangle uh, all the papers on the archive into their various archive categories without actually looking at the label, whether it's from HEPPH or HEPX, just trying it doing it based on the word choice that are used. The hope is that you might be able to do something similar for quark and gluon jets. And um, to do this though, you need to make an assumption. And this assumption is one that's very well motivated in the context of quantum field theory, but it is an assumption. And for me, what's amazing is that simply the statement of the assumption, I remember when this happened in, 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 uh, in kind of 2017, 2018, you know, I said, well, if this were true, then we'd be done. And then the answer was, oh yes, and now we're done. I was kind of a surprise that machine learning could do this once you made this assumption. Um, the fundamental assumption is that it's possible to make samples of jets that are mixtures of quarks and gluons. And when you, when you first hear that, you're like, well, of course, <laughs> jets are composed of quark jets and gluon jets. And anytime I look at a sample of jets, then there's some kind of mixture of quarks and gluons. So why is this a, an assumption? So let, let me try to explain this. So I have a distribution of all sorts of different type of jet features. So it, this could be the number of particles in the jet, how many pions versus kaons, uh, the total charge, uh, you know, how much invariant mass that it has, some other properties. And these are features of the jet that I could, for example, insert into a machine learning algorithm. And there's a probability distribution for what those features would look like if I had quark jets and a probability distribution of what those features would look like if I had gluon jets. And in this case, the blue and the red is pure quark jets and pure gluon jets, the idealized version of what a quark jet and a gluon jet would be. And what I would say is I could take a linear combination of my uh, quark jets and gluon jets by a fraction F, and this fraction F would basically interpolate between quarks and gluons. So this quark fraction, if it's zero, then I have pure gluon, whatever that means. <laughs> if it's one, then I have pure quark, whatever that means. But assuming that this makes sense, this equation makes sense, that it's possible to make jet samples that are mixtures of quarks and gluons, everything falls out after this just from algebra. So let's try to make a sample like that. So let's, for example, say I want to look at jets that hit this particular kind of somewhat forward-ish region in the detector. So this is a, a picture um, of one of the LHC detectors. You can see these back-to-back -back jets here. Um, and let's say if I have sample A are taking all the jets that land in this part of the detector. This selection is one that doesn't bias the features of the jet. All it does is it change the fraction of how much quark versus gluon that I have. If I made a, a selection that said, I wanna take all the jets that have three particles in them, exactly three, that would bias my selection. That would, that would pick not the full probability distribution of all the jet features, but just you know, those ones corresponding to having three particles. But if I select jets that are in a particular region of the detector uh, from a, a, a principle in quantum field theory called factorization, we say that the probability of a jet landing in this part of the detector roughly factorizes from or is separate from what exactly the manifestation of that jet is. That is, how many particles that it, does it have, what's invariant mass, and so on. And so by isolating region A, I can take a sample of jets that is some mixture of quarks and gluons. I could look, for example, at region B, let's say in the center part of my, my jet region, that would give me a different uh, uh, mixture. And as I said, it's non-trivial to do this. This assumes that these A and B mixtures that I've built have unbiased jet properties. That is, I'm not changing the distributions of quarks versus gluons. All I'm changing is the proportion of quarks versus gluons. Now from this, assumption, then there's a trick. So again, my goal is to define what I mean by quark and gluon. I don't know what I mean by quark and gluon. All I have are mixtures A and B. That's all I have. And here's the amazing fact, uh, which we learned from a paper from uh, Kat Samuels, Blanchard, and Scott from 2016, that 
given these mixtures A and B, you can define quarks and gluons from this. As I said, blind source separation is kind of like a complicated linear algebra problem. And because it's a linear algebra problem, I can take linear combinations of A and B and try to disentangle them back into their primary quark and gluon components. And indeed you can do that. In equations, here's how it works. So my goal is to figure out what is a quark jet? Well, I take mixture A, I subtract off pieces of mixture B, and I keep subtracting off pieces of mixture B until I get to the point where the probability, which has to be positive, just hits zero, it's, it would go negative. You can't have negative probabilities. So because we can't have negative probabilities, if I keep subtracting, if I keep taking this kappa value and increasing it more and more and more, at some point, I can't subtract anymore. And that defines for me in a operational way what I mean by the most separable component, which we're just gonna give the name of quark. We can do the same thing with gluon. We can take the B distribution, subtract off A, keep subtracting, subtracting, subtracting until we hit zero at some feature location. It can't go negative because then it wouldn't be a probability. That defines for me uh, what a gluon is. And if I choose kappa as big as possible, this yields what uh, uh, Kat Samuels et al. defined as mutual irreducible distributions, what I would define as a rigorous definition of what I mean by quarks and gluons. Because this subtraction procedure is not only something that I can do in data, it's something that I can also do in my quantum field theory calculation. And again, this is just linear algebra. This is just a data science trick. At this point, we haven't even really brought in any fancy machine learning that's gonna come in a few slides. But I'd never thought about my problem this way before. I'd thought about the definition of a quark or a gluon is something that appears in my Lagrangian. I hadn't thought of that a quark or a gluon could be defined in this fully data-driven way as a subtraction of two distributions. Um, and yet, as far as I can tell, this is the most rigorous way to define quarks and gluons, and in fact agreed with this analysis that we're doing in 2017 about the most well-defined way of defining quarks and gluons. So it was kind of amazing to see this. And even more amazing to see that this was actually measured in 2019 uh, in data by the ATLAS experiment. So here is a histogram of the number of charged particles that you see inside of a jet. Here is a distribution in the forward jet region. Here's the distribution in the central jet region. These distributions look really similar to each other. <laughs> But nevertheless, you can subtract one from the other, keep subtracting, keep subtracting until you get these mutually irreducible uh, distributions, topic one and topic two, which correspond very well to uh, the definition uh, that would appear in a, in a uh, kind of a, a, a parton shower Monte Carlo program called Pythia for what you would mean by a quark or a gluon. But again, this is something that's data-driven, rigorously defined, and we'll, we'll take it even more uh, in the next part of the talk. Okay, but... At this point, you should be you should be concerned. You should be concerned, but don't these jet topics don't don't the way that I do the subtraction, this way of separating out quark and gluon, doesn't it depend on the choice of jet features that I use? On the previous slide, I used the number of charged particles. I could have used something else. Wouldn't I get something different depending on what I choose to measure? And the answer is yes. You're totally right. It depends on the jet features. It seems ambiguous, and this is where machine learning comes in. Machine learning allows us to define maximum separability through something that's called weak supervision, uh, something that uh, the particular algorithm we use is, is called classification without labels. So koala, that sounds a little bit like koala, like the, uh, like the, uh, the animal. So that's why you have the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the cute koala here. And then reading a book because uh, we're gonna be taking this uh, weak supervision technique uh, combining it with this natural language processing uh, topic modeling procedure and using this to understand quark and gluon jets. Okay, so let me uh, try to explain this next part. So again, where we were here, we're trying to find quark and gluons. We succeeded in finding a definition of quark and gluons, but I would like to find the optimal definition of quarks and gluons, the one with maximum separability. And machine learning promises to find the optimal discriminant between different categories. And this is something that hopefully you've either learned already this week or, or will learn later, is uh, uh, full supervision, binary classification, kind of the simplest thing that I can do uh, with machine learning, trained on pure, perfectly labeled examples. Uh, this is the kind of classic thing that you wanna do if you wanna uh, distinguish uh, two categories from each other. And you have a loss function. In this case, this loss function down the bottom here is mean squared error loss. Um, 
But if you say, I want my signal events to be labeled one, I want my background events to be labeled zero, and I want to define the best classifier to try to separate signal from background, then minimizing any of the standard loss functions, given enough training data, gives you this classifier H, which tries to get you this maximum separability. This classifier is built out of the probabilities of signal and background. The numerator has just the probability of the signal. The denominator has the probability of the signal plus the probability of the background. And this X tells you what is the input that you're seeing. So let's say you're in a region of phase space that's pure signal. If you're pure signal, then the probability of the signal is some value. The probability of the background is zero. And therefore you have signal over signal that just gives you one. So that's what you want. And if you're in a region of pure signal, then you get one as desired. If you're in a region of pure background, then the probability of the signal is zero. Therefore you get zero. And if you're in an ambiguous region, if there's overlap of signal and background, then you get something going between zero or one. And that's the best you could possibly do. That's the best separation that you could ever achieve between signal and background. And what machine learning classifiers, at least in this binary classification strategy are trying to do is trying to find that function, which gives you this optimal separability. Now, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to separate quarks and gluons, but I don't know what quarks and gluons are. I want to do this optimal separation between signal and background. Let's call signal to be uh, quarks and background to be gluons, but I don't have them. All I have are these mixtures. And this classification without labels technique, uh, which I developed with, uh, with Eric Watodiev and, and Bang Nachman, who you heard uh, from yesterday. This is a strategy where you can train directly on mixed data, take your mixed sample A, your mixed sample B, which is some combination of quarks and gluons. You can train these things. And you'd say, well, why is this useful at all? The mixed sample classifier optimally separates A from B. That's not what I want. I want to optimally separate quark from gluon, but I don't know what quark and gluon are. So how can I do that? And this is one of the most magical pieces of algebra that I've ever done uh, in, in, in my career because it's just two lines and it was so surprising that it was true. W while it is true that the mixed classifier and the pure classifier aren't the same, they are monotonically related to each other. And I'm happy to go through this algebra if people wanna, wanna see more of this, but what this means is that this weak supervision, not having strong supervision, not having full information about your categories, having this noisy mixture of, 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 uh, of, or, of, of the categories, that nevertheless yields the same decision boundaries as what you would get if you had pure quark and gluon. And so now we can combine this. This is the optimal way of separating out the mixtures. It's the optimal way of separating out quarks and gluons. Then I can use this topic modeling procedure to define for myself what quarks and gluons are. And so with having weak supervision, meeting topic modeling, again, work with Patrick and Eric, we were able to do the following. We were able to train a machine learning classifier to separate out two mixtures. In this particular case, it's not forward and central jets. It happens to be die jets and Z plus jets for, for this plot. If I had pure quark and gluon samples, then the output of my classifier would go between zero and one. Those would be the extremes. But in this mixed case, I can't do this. There's an irreducible mixture. But nevertheless, the boundaries, how much I can separate out things, that actually gives you information about what the quark gluon composition is. And you can use this together with topic modeling to then disentangle your purple and pink mixture distributions, disentangle them into the orange and green topic distributions, which correspond very well to our understanding of quarks and gluons as implemented in a Monte Carlo generator. But these dash curves showing what quarks and gluons are, that's just to guide the eye. I never actually needed those dashed curves. Rather, I can just take the data directly and get the orange and, and green distributions. I can define quark and gluons directly from the data using these machine learning strategies. And so just by assuming that jet samples are mixtures of quarks and gluons, which itself is a well-motivated assumption in the context of factorization in quantum field theory, from that, we can now operationally define jet categories and answer this question that I had back in 2017 of what is a quark jet and a gluon jet? Well, the quark jet and the gluon jet is the outcome of this particular algorithm that I just showed you. And again, something rigorous that can be done on theory, done on experiment, and uses machine learning in a fundamental way. And in fact, I don't know how to do that technique without uh, some level of machine learning. Okay, so that was a story back in 2018. And now I wanna rocket to the future, going very quickly over a suite of really 
fun, exciting techniques that we developed along the way to really flesh out this story. And um, not surprisingly, uh, you know, these techniques are, are relevant for you know, more complex things than just quark and gluon discrimination. Quark and gluon discrimination is kind of the hello world of jet physics. You know, the simplest binary classification. There's many more interesting things that hopefully uh, 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 Sung and, and uh, Gregor and, and David are talking to you about this week. Um, but we're going to stick with quark and gluon discrimination and just tell you something about the toolkit that uh, my group has been using uh, to uh, study more about the quark and gluon jet properties. And again, learn something more about the structure of quantum field theory through the machine learning lens. So um, this started in, in 2019 uh, when I went to a workshop at the Aspen Center for Physics called Theoretical Physics for Machine Learning. And uh, I gave a talk at this, uh, at this workshop um, talking about a collision course, both a collision course in the sense of what I'm doing right now. I'm teaching a little bit about collider physics, slamming together protons, getting jets coming out. But then also a collision course as in two fields coming together, the field of high energy physics and the fields of mathematics, statistics, and computer science, who kind of remarkably to me are asking similar questions. Uh, and I felt like I was gaining new insights into, into particle physics facilitated by advances in machine learning. And I also felt like um, I could uh, use my particle physics knowledge to actually advance the way that we were doing machine learning uh, uh, tools. And it was really exciting to see this, this collision and this collision is ongoing. And, uh, and our Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions is uh, a manifestation of this, bringing together communities to try to address really challenging questions in the physical sciences. So I'm not gonna tell you everything that results from this collision. So I'm going to cue the montage. So we're just gonna go you know, rapid fire through uh, some of the things that happened over the years, uh, which synthesize things from the high energy physics and the uh, machine learning worlds. So one of the things that we needed uh, is we needed really powerful machine learning algorithms. And one of the things that we developed in, in 2019 were techniques in point cloud learning, uh, a technique called energy flow networks, which were a set-based architecture with an interpretable latent space. And I'm happy to tell you more about what these equations mean. But what was exciting for us when we developed this machine learning architecture is that we could actually look inside the black box and make pictures like this. This is a visual representation about how this energy flow network was parsing quark and gluon jet information. And what you can see are these rings. These rings correspond to places where the machine is paying attention to, where a jet is a radiation pattern going into the page here. And so you can imagine the spray of radiation going into the center of the page. And then you have these small rings in the center and larger rings on the outside and so on. And this pattern, which the machine learned without us telling it, this pattern corresponds precisely to the collinear singularity structure of QCD that I told you about before, this d theta over theta thing. There's a, a, a way you can actually show that this pattern of rings and the fact that things like denser and denser and denser towards the center, the way it gets denser is exactly in accordance with what you would get from this collinear singularity structure. So that was uh, really cool to see, a machine learning architecture based on, on, on sets, uh, which are a simplified version of what you can do with more powerful graph neural networks that we look at today. But these set-based architectures had this interpretable latent space and the interpretation of it is something that we already know about from the QCD world. Another thing that we did is we uh, took techniques from uh, the machine learning framework of optimal transport and applied it to develop a collider geometry. So this uh, is work that was coming up with ways of triangulating a space of collider events. So what you would do is you would take two collision events. So like this is taking a, a slice out of my detector. The red splotches correspond to energy being deposited at certain parts of my detector. The blue splotches corresponding to a different energy deposit. And you can use techniques from optimal transport to deform the red jet configuration into the blue jet configuration. And the difficulty of doing that uh, that deformation corresponds to a distance. And once you have distances, you can now do all sorts of geometric things like build manifolds or build triangulate things. And uh, this optimal transport idea allowed us to define a collider geometry and actually let us do a different way of visualizing collider data uh, by triangulating the space of, of uh, energy radiation patterns. So in the machine learning world, this is called the earth movers distance uh, because you're taking these uh, mounds of, of, of these blobs. You can think about this as earth or dirt that you move from one place to another. 
In the particle physics context, we were moving energy around. So we called this the energy movers distance. And this EMD was a really powerful strategy for doing geometric data analysis. And again, coming from the machine learning world. And there was fun stuff that we could do with this. We could say, okay, now that we've triangulated the space, let's actually try to make pictures of the space. This is a, a triangulation that uh, appears, as we'll see in a, in a second, in a kind of super fractal dimensionality. Trying to make a picture of that is quite difficult, but was, this is our, our best attempt. And what we're doing here is we're taking this crazy geometry and trying to flatten it so that it appears on a, on a two-dimensional slide. And uh, the gray blob are 30,000 jets arranged in such a way that the distance between those 30,000 jets mimics the distance as measured by this optimal transport problem. And then sprinkled on top are these example jet configurations that correspond to uh, uh, representative uh, uh, radiation patterns that come from these jet sprays. So when we did this the first time, it was like, oh, that's kind of an interesting, pretty picture. And staring at this mo some more, we realized, wait a second, this machine learning strategy that we used to make this picture, this itself has a physical interpretation to it. That is the dimensions that came out of this particular two-dimensional projection corresponded precisely to the coordinates that I was trying to tell you about before, the opening angle theta and the momentum fraction Z that appear in the uh, QCD splitting function. In particular, if you go from left to right, you can see that the jets on the left-hand side have like a real uh, hard central core whereas the jets on the right-hand side have this uh, larger opening angle configuration. So that's the theta direction. And then if you go from bottom to top, it's a little bit hard to see here, but you might be able to tell that on the bottom here, you have an asymmetric energy sharing where one sub piece has more energy than the other piece. Whereas if I go to the top, you have more balanced energy sharing. Again, the machine had figured out this feature of QCD, uh, the coordinate system that are used to define radiation patterns. And you can even do more things. You can uh, uh, try to quantify the dimensionality of this crazy geometric structure. And as I said, this is kind of like a super fractal structure. So this is something where depending on the resolution scale that you're using to try to analyze this collider geometry, you actually get different answers. Um, and so here, uh, if you're looking at high energy scales, you're looking at scales where all you can see is effectively a single quark or gluon. A single quark or gluon is like a single dot. That single dot basically has dimensionality of zero. So that's all you can see if that's your resolution scale. But as you go and zoom in and in and in, or go down and down and down in energy scale, this cartoon that I showed you before of how jets form, you actually can see this now in a data-driven way where the dimensionality grows. And as you get more and more quark and gluon emission, you actually see the dimensionality increase in a fascinating way. And the scaling behavior of QCD, the fact that we actually have a non-trivial renormalization group running coming from these splittings, uh, this, uh, this scaling behavior, this is a data science-y way of, of seeing it. And then, you know, looking at this plot, you're like, oh, that's, that's a nice plot, but hey, why do you have three curves here? One curve in black is the actual data as seen by the CMS experiment in this open data. The orange curve here is what I would get from a simulation of my detector. But the blue curve is actually what we think QCD looks like uh, as generated by a, a powerful Monte Carlo generator. And in fact, the blue curve is what you would get at the truth level. The orange is what you get after you pass it through your detector. And so your detector actually smears things out and generates extra dimensionality. And this smearing, the fact that the blue and the orange curves don't match, says, wait, detector effects are distorting the underlying physics. Now let's try to correct that. We've used this uh, machine learning to study jets. Let's use machine learning to fix up jets. And uh, we developed a technique called Omnifold, which is a way of doing multidimensional unbinned detector corrections by iterative application of machine learning reweighting. Uh, I'm not going to try to explain this to you at all. Again, uh, my collaborator, Ben, uh, was one of the people uh, who helped develop this. And so we really have all these ingredients together. We can do these heroic analyses. And then what happened in 2020? I think we all know uh, what happened. We had the pandemic. Uh, my research program stalled out a little bit uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we had all these ingredients, didn't have a chance to really put it all together. Plus, at the same time, we decided that now is the time to try to launch an artificial intelligence institute. So we launched uh, our Institute for Artificial Intelligence and Fundamental Interactions, which was try to, trying to instantiate this collision between these two fields. And now it felt like a good time to revisit whether we could put the 
AI back in the ultra early breezy splitting kernel. That is, could we really use artificial intelligence and machine learning to expose all the possible uh, dynamics of, of, uh, of QCD and also use it to search for dynamics beyond QCD? So I've already told you how we can you know, understand the splitting kernels, we can understand the coordinate space, the collinear singularity structure, and this earlier work on coming up with the soft singularity structure. What I really want to do is I'd love to measure alpha s using machine learning. That's for uh, the future. But for this talk, can I tell the difference between quarks and gluons? Can I separate these things out? And now finally, we have all the ingredients to do this separation. So where are we now? It's now 2022. Uh, all my collaborators in the past, so uh, 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 Eric, uh, you had uh, Radha, Preksha, uh, Anders, Ben, and then uh, an, uh, a student, Serhi, who uh, joined my research group to help put all this, uh, these pieces together. We had quark and gluon jets from the strong force. Fundamental physics, really one of the core things uh, about the standard model. Confronting it with public collider data, this incredible release from the CMS experiment, allowing us as theorists to do open data analyses and actually do these machine learning studies directly on data. Unfolded for detector effects using this omnifold uh, uh, algorithm. Disentangled using weak supervision on set-based classifiers with topic modeling. So I told you a little bit about all these various ingredients. Again, this is the, the algorithm that allows us to, from mixtures, uh, come up with the pure categories and then triangulated using this optimal transport technique. And you know, part of the reason also why this took us such a long time to do is that we have all these technical details about how we extract some of these, these factors and how do we determine uncertainties and how do we do validation. And I'm happy to try to explain what these plots are uh, in Q&A. But the point that I want to communicate to you is that once you know the quark fractions of a sample, once you've used machine learning to do that, then the rest is just linear algebra. And you're able to do things like take that dimensionality plot that I showed you before and now separate it out into actually three types of dimensionality. So you can talk about in blue, the dimensionality of quark jets. You can talk about the in red, the dimensionality of gluon jets. And then in purple, it's the dimensionality of quark jets as viewed from the gluon frame or vice versa. So these are kind of different ways of quantifying dimensionality. And what you're seeing in the solid curves are what you're extracting from data. And the dash curve is what you would get from a Monte Carlo generator. At truth level, all the direct sector effects have been corrected for. And you see fairly good agreement uh, between these. And at the same time, we can do a first principles QCD calculation that tells me that the dimensionality, this mixed dimensionality, is proportional to the strong coupling constant. So that tells you how fast this rise goes. It's proportional to a logarithm in the transverse momentum. So that tells you what the shape of this is. And then you sum up the, uh, the color factors of uh, the different types of jets involved. And this plot really gives you now the color factors of QCD. The precise way that these curves are rising is proportional to the color factors. And if I do a manipulation of this curve just to make it really uh, blindingly obvious uh, what, we, what we have, uh, this is a fully data-driven extraction of the quark gluon color ratio by basically taking that theory curves and taking appropriate ratios of the, of the, of, of the curves on this slide so for example, I can take the ratio of the red curve over the blue curve. Um, and the ratio of the red curve over the blue curve is a ratio, all the logarithms in the alpha S drops out, that gives you a ratio of three over four thirds or, or nine quarters. This dashed line is the prediction from a very naive calculation. And you can see the data, of course it's wiggly because it's, uh, it's noisy, uh, but the data matches beautifully with that nine quarters. And in fact, it matches more beautifully with that nine quarters than the naive thing that you would do of running your Monte Carlo and just taking the naive quark and gluon labels, which is the standard thing that we would do for uh, fully supervised machine learning. So actually this is a cautionary tale uh, about if you do fully supervised machine learning with quark and gluon labels, you have to be careful that actually the quark and gluon labels that you get out are not really the same thing as what you would get from this more robust and theoretically uh, well-defined extraction. And then there's another combination that you can do whose ratio is, is, is one as a cross-check that you're doing the right thing with this analysis. But for me, this plot, when, when this plot was made, I, I, you know, well, almost literally had tears in my eyes, like this five year long saga of studying quark and gluon jets resulting in a plot where with no assumptions, just using the assumption, sorry, with one assumption, the assumption that I can make mixed samples of quark and gluon jets from that one assumption using all these machine learning strategies, I can then pull out this very fundamental prediction of the strong force 
uh, and see it directly in the in the data. And so this is an example of gaining new insights into the strong force by fuses, fusing advances in machine learning with insights from quantum field theory and doing something that I think is really representative of the way that I hope our field is able to progress using machine learning in a principled way, not abandoning all the things that we've learned uh, as, as theoretical physicists, uh, uh, not abandoning the things that, that we've learned in our uh, analysis of, of experimental data, uh, but really uh, fusing that with our machine learning advances, uh, something that I think is uh, uh, really a powerful way going forward. So with that, let me just uh, summarize and then, and then take questions from all of you. So I explained to you this, uh, this quark-gluon conundrum where quark and gluon jets offer an extreme example where fully supervised learning is fundamentally ambiguous. And this is what I was complaining to my former students, Patrick and Eric about in 2017. I thought that there was no solution. Amazingly, there is a solution in machine learning. Assuming that these quark and gluon cat jet categories exist, one can use machine learning to operationally define them. And once they're being defined, you can do all sorts of amazing studies of the strong force using it. And I feel like jet physics has now crossed an important threshold where machine learning is now yielding insights that go beyond traditional analysis techniques. And uh, happy to tell you more about this and happy to hear your thoughts uh, about this intersection between these, these fields. So let me stop there and uh, take your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the nice talk. And we have time for questions. Uh, uh, thank you for a great talk. And I have a question about uh, classification. Uh, is there any uh, particle or uh, is those species of like, it's like cork or glue, but it must not be cork or glue. So the, the, if the question is, um, let's say I'm given a jet sample and uh, I have some type of jet that's neither quark nor gluon, it's something else. Is that the, is that the question, yeah. something along those lines? Yes. Oh, yes, it's or something else or like it have to be quark, but it's like not quark. Good, good. So, so what, what's interesting is that uh, all, all, uh, all the uh, particles in the standard model, eventually they form jets. <laughs> So yes. top quarks when made with sufficiently high Lorentz boost, those uh, create jets, W and Z bosons, those create jets. Even neutrinos, when you make them at high enough energy, eventually they'll radiate off W and Z bosons, which themselves will decay to quarks, which then will create jets. So everything eventually at high enough energies turns into these jet sprays. And a really interesting question is, what if I didn't know all the jet categories? Here I talked about quark and gluon jets, but those are jet categories that I knew about already. What if I had a new category that I didn't know about? How would I go about processing the data to find it? And this is something where uh, a lot of people are thinking about it. Uh, so you may hear some things about anomaly detection uh, in your, in your uh, lectures this week, um, but it's a really interesting question about what do you need to assume in order to take a data set and decompose it into its components? And in the context of uh, existing machine learning strategies, this is a kind of an open question. So this literature that I'm citing down here, they tell you how to do things if you assume, I know that there are five categories, then it will tell you the algorithm to find five categories. Or if you say, I know that there's seven categories, it will tell you the algorithm to find seven categories. But let's say you don't know the number of categories. And this is actually something that's an open question uh, within the machine learning world about how best to do that. And it's something that we would like to do if we would like to search for a category that's not quark, not gluon, maybe not even anything in the standard model. We wanna be able to use some strategy that would be able to give us confidence that we've seen something new um, without us having to put it in by hand. Uh, and I would say that that's an uh, open development that I'll be excited to see if this progress made in that direction. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, could you first show the second and last slide? Yeah, one second. Yeah. This one or this one? Yes. This one? Yes. 
you know, either one is fine. Uh, so yeah. here you show the uh, machine learning uh, predictions, and how uh, what what do you do with uh, theoretical errors or I mean systematic errors, etc. That's one question, and the mm -hmm. second question is, uh, how well can you uh, distinguish the quark flavors? Mm -hmm. For example, Higgs to BB bar, CC bar, SS bar, etc. That, so uh, that's my two questions. Yeah, great. Well, so let me answer the, the second question first. So, so this analysis is good for understanding the bulk properties of quark and gluon jets. This is an overall property of quark and gluon jets. This is not trying to identify an individual jet as being a quark or a gluon or a B-tag. Uh, and there's actually quite good uh, algorithms for isolating B-quark jets. And it would be pretty interesting to actually take this analysis and uh, see what would happen if I applied uh, some kind of B-tagging to it and see what the answer would be. So uh, I, I don't know the answer for, for jet flavor. Uh, but this technique can, in principle, be applied to multiple categories. You can see already how noisy things are. So because it's so noisy, you need really lots and lots of data to do this. Uh, but at least it's something that's in principle possible. Now, the question that you asked, which is in some sense the key question about theoretical systematics, let's start off with experimental systematics. We're doing an experimental analysis. We're correcting it for detector effects. We're applying all these machine learning techniques, a huge number of things that we'd like to quantify the uncertainties from. Then on top of that, we have my theory calculation here, but this is a theory calculation only done to a low order. I would like to be able to predict, if not the higher order, I'd like to know what is the uncertainty on that? And a lot of people uh, say, well, machine learning is just adding on to the uncertainties. It's just making things more and more uncertain. How do I ever gonna learn anything? And I go the other direction. I say, because machine learning allows you to process data in this unified, uh, powerful, computationally intensive, but it's the computer doing the work, not the human doing the work. Because of that, I actually see this as an opportunity for us to explore more types of uncertainty than we do using traditional techniques. So on the theory uncertainty side, I'm trying to figure out how can I actually put uncertainties on a formula like this in a way that I could apply to a machine learning algorithm. On the experimental side, you'd like to know how can you actually compute the uncertainties uh, associated with some of these techniques. And my suspicion is that machine learning is going to be the strategy that we can use for determining uncertainties in a more robust way. Uh, and, and so an example of this is some work that I've been doing with my student, Rikab Gambier, and uh, also with Ben Nachman, where you can set up a neural network, train it to do something, but at the same time where it's learning to do that task, at exactly the same time, it also learns the uncertainties associated with it. And the uncertainties that it learns are standard frequentist uncertainties. Uh, by the way, there are, there are techniques already called Bayesian neural networks, which are a powerful way of getting uh, Bayesian type uh, uncertainties. Um, and uh, you may even hear about that <laughs> this, this week, uh, potentially from, from David or Gregor. Uh, but what's cool about the technique that we're working on is that it's a standard frequentist style uh, uh, uncertainties. And it comes from one machine learning training. And so the machine learning training gives you both the central value and confidence intervals at the same time. And that's a, uh, uh, and it allows you to do that. It's in a very high dimensional space where, where actually the uncertainties are, are hopefully more accurate than what you would get from standard low dimensional methods. So that's the hope. That's where I think this is going. But you ask exactly the right question. How do we do uncertainties? And, you know, I'm embarrassed that these curves don't have error bars on them. The next version of this plot will absolutely have error bars once we figure out how to use machine learning in this context to really put robust error bars on this. Uh, hi, Jesse. Uh, while we're on this plot, I'm actually confused about something. So yeah. you said that the leading order or leading log prediction is dotted and yep. then parton level is dashed. Yep. So the, it's quite different than the leading log. What, what's yes. the difference there? I do not understand this. This is basically saying that Pythia, the quarks and gluons that are coming out of Pythia, differ from your naive leading log expectation, dramatically, actually. Whereas if you apply this technique, this topic modeling technique, you actually get something that's closer to the leading log prediction. And so uh, this is using a, 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 an old version of Pythia. So this is Pythia 6. And the reason why we're using Pythia 6 is because that's what came with this particular version of the CMS open data. I would love to be able to do the same type of analysis with, with 
uh, newer part-time shower Monte Carlo programs, as well as ones that have error bars on it. But what I think is going on here is that the Pythia labeled information about whether you have a quark or a gluon, uh, it's not accounting for the fact that you can have a radiation that then in some sense switches the flavor. So you could, for example, have a gluon that then splits into a QQ bar pair. And if it splits early enough in the shower, then the radiation pattern that you get is not the original gluon, it's closer to the quark that comes from that first splitting. So that's my suspicion about what's going on here is that the labeling is inaccurate because you have a hard splitting at the top of the chain. Um, and that hard splitting uh, would go indeed in the direction of, of making it tilt in this direction. Uh, but that's just speculation. Uh, it's quite satisfying at some level that this topic modeling procedure is closer to the leading log prediction than the naive parton level information. And just to emphasize, this naive parton level one is what we get when we use quark and gluon samples fully labeled. Um, and so I think this is interesting thing to understand about whether those fully labeled data samples, to what extent the fact that it's inheriting this kind of skew, to what extent that affects our, our ability to do quark gluon tagging. I see. Thanks. Very interesting. Yeah. Uh, there is a nice graph of the gluon momentum fraction one over G. Uh, this also means that uh, you successfully extracted the gluon jet from the coke jet. No, uh, it, it, in oh. fact, so so you're saying, ooh, I get to see this uh, this one over Z, and then ooh, this admitted thing isn't that a good gluon jet? Yeah, uh, I think so. yeah, that would be amazing. It, it, it turns out yeah. that that's not the case, um, and that there's 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 uh, there's quark contamination here. So so there's 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 a little bit of an there's a little bit of, of a sneakiness here. So I so in in the story that I told, I said, oh, the leading prediction here is one of just gluon emission. But of course, there's subleading effects, and those subleading effects actually play a pretty prominent role in uh, getting this. So I can't, I, I wish I could use this to get an uh, isolated sample of pure, pure gluon jets, but it sadly it does not work this way. And there's actually plenty of quarks in here coming from gluon splitting to QQ bar, as well as uh, quark splitting to a gluon quark where it's asymmetric. So, yes, that's an excellent idea. We thought about doing that, and unfortunately, it doesn't work that well. But uh, yeah. Oh. It is gluon enriched. That is certainly true. It's gluon enriched, but it's not pure. Ah, I yeah. see. Many gluon there. Many gluons, but not but, but not a hundred percent. I see. Yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, usually, the topping models deal with discrete random variables, and uh, I just wonder: uh, your data is discrete, or uh, how you dealt with uh, your data? Using topping model, and and yeah. and, uh, and and another thing is that uh, after you get the distribution or density function for the words for each topic, gluon and quark, how did you make the boundary from the from the information? Okay, good. So uh, you're right. So the standard way of doing topic modeling, uh, you have discrete quantities, and uh, what are the discrete quantities? What are the discrete equivalents of the words? And what they are, are the histogram bins. So the histogram bins are discrete. So when you have a fixed number of histogram bins, that means you have a fixed vocabulary, a fixed number of words. So that's the discrete part. Um, but that's actually not very satisfying because I mentioned that we have a machine learning algorithm that's able to work on continuous values. So what you'd like to do is you'd somehow like to take the topic modeling procedure that works on discrete words and figure out how can you apply that to the continuous context. And so these plots that I skipped over are actually our attempt at doing that. So what you do is you build a receiver operator characteristic curve uh, with as fine binning as you possibly can. And then instead of trying to do standard topic modeling, you actually do something funny of trying to extract the slope of the rock curve at the endpoint. And that actually turns out to be in a certain limit, the same thing as uh, doing what you would do with, uh, with, with, with topic modeling. Um, but what we're trying to, so that's the discrete part is the binning, but we want to make the bins as small as possible, basically make our vocabulary as big as possible. Um, so that's, but, it, but it's, a, it's a very different type of topic modeling than what you would do for the standard uh, natural language processing case. Now, in terms of how we set our boundary, um, what we set our boundary was not actually ever setting a boundary. We just did this extrapolation. We extrapolated to the limit where we were trying to isolate the most pure quark or the most pure gluon configuration. 
So let me give you the, the version of this in natural language processing. If I give you a, a text that has the word energy in it, the word energy could be a word that's in the physics literature. It could also be in the word of the, let's say, climate science literature. And if I say energy conservation, energy conservation has a physics meaning, but it also has a meaning in the climate science literature. But if I go to a really rarefied region of phase space, if I go to the region of word phase space where I use Noether's theorem, Noether's theorem is something that only a physicist would say, and something like Kyoto Protocol or Paris Accord, those would be something that would appear only in, in, the, um, in the climate science literature. And so what we're doing by this extrapolation is we're basically trying to push ourselves into the regions of phase space that are fully enriched. And that allows you to extract these fractions. And then we use those fractions using linear algebra to then build up the rest of the distribution. Uh, but it's using what uh, uh, natural language processing people will call anchor words. It's the anchor words that I use to do the separation between uh, the quark and gluon categories. And that, that's equivalent to finding those things that are um, uh, like right up in the boundary of being able to do the subtraction. The thing that as I, as I push to the limit, I end up getting the probability really, really close to zero, the very rarefied thing. That's the thing that actually helps me define what pure quark and gluon is, these extreme regions of phase space that in some sense define the category. Did that, did that answer your question? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, hello. So since you are talking about extracting um, concrete um, QCD physics from data, so I imagine um, the bigger volume of data might help us um, understand the physics better. So mm -hmm. are you going to be excited if maybe um, high luminosity LHC starts to produce results or just LHC collaborations decide to um, release more existing data? Good. So uh, there's a couple things to say. So, so one of the things to say first is that this study that we did of QCD, this is the QCD that we know about. This is quarks and gluons. People have talked about this concept, you know, from the early days of QCD. But there's plenty of things about QCD that we don't actually understand very well. Um, so my colleagues who work in, in nuclear physics, who work in heavy ion physics, they have all sorts of questions about the dynamics of, of strongly correlated systems that they'd love to be able to analyze. Uh, and so there's exploration that can be done even if you have small data sets. As we start increasing the size of the data set, two things happen. One, the questions that we can ask get really, really interesting. That's the one thing that happens. The other thing that happens, unfortunately, is that my ability to do the calculation stops because I only have finite computing resources. So with open data, open data is really good for these proof of concept studies, but we actually don't have the ability to study the full uh, range of data that was provided to us. So just, just as an example, um, in this plot that I showed here, um, the PT jet range, we took the super narrow slice, 495 to 505 GeV. This is actually narrower than the resolution that we have on the jet energy. But the reason why we did this tight cut is because we couldn't process more data than that. This is actually a really expensive algorithm to run. And we were limited in our computational power. And it starts to get really expensive when you try to run these tools. So I don't want to be the one to run it. But I get really excited to try to take some of these ideas and talk to our experimental friends who actually have much bigger computing resources and then give them some ideas of things to study. And examples of things that you can start doing once you have much larger data sets um, are things like studying spin correlations, which are really difficult to do if you ha only have this size data set, or looking for extreme, uh, uh, or looking for anomalies in extreme regions of phase space, or trying to find correlations between multiple different features. Um, these are things that are, are enabled once you have larger and larger and larger data sets. Unfortunately, when you have larger and larger data sets, they no longer fit on our computers. And we are basically capped on the amount of data that we can process. Once it exceeds 10 terabytes of information, you basically can't do this anymore with our, our computing resources. Um, and even 10 terabytes when you're doing machine learning based stuff, 
you, you run into the problem that you're, you're spending all your time reading from disk and you, you know, even if you have a really fast uh, GPU farm, it doesn't help you because you're, you're spending all your time <laughs> going to the hard drive. So I, I think there is a lot of exciting things to explore as we get bigger data sets. And I have some ideas of what we're going to do, what we could do if we have three inverse atabarns of data for things to study. Um, but I'm not the one to do it. I can do my little studies with open data, but hopefully some of these ideas we can figure out pencil and paper what to do and then uh, collaborate with our experimental uh, friends to actually implement some of these more rarefied analyses that really require giant data sets. Oh, so it is not only data limited, but we are also, we also need more computing power and we, so I hope to see that in future. Thank you yes, we, we are, we, that's right. We, we are computing power limited. And uh, I think this is one of the things that's also happening in the machine learning world is, is people are thinking about, okay, if I have all this computing power, what can I do? But also, could I achieve the same science uh, for things that are, are less expensive computationally? And there's a whole branch of people working on machine learning where you're trying to say, can I make machine learning that's small enough and fast enough to run uh, at the same rate as the trigger? So I mentioned that there's collisions every 25 nanoseconds. Can you have machine learning algorithms that can make decisions on the 25 nanosecond time scale? Could you actually imagine filling histograms in real time uh, where you can actually do all analyses in real time? And maybe we can have more lightweight machine learning that could allow us to do things like that. Um, the stuff that I talk about in this talk, unfortunately, is very expensive. Hopefully there's cheaper versions of that if we want to really scale up to uh, the three in Prasada barn uh, size. Any questions from the audience in Zoom? Uh, I think we had uh, many questions, but let me ask one quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. This is actually a follow-up question uh, the, after Byung-won asked about the, how to distinguish the different flavors. Mm -hmm. I, I know it's, it's very ex expensive computationally, and it requires additional work, but uh, don't you think that it might be easier to look at the up type and down type? Because electric charges are different, so maybe you know number of charge tracks and so on. Yeah, yeah. So, so we actually already have enough uh, data to do that. Uh, so we had a summer student uh, come to MIT. This was before the pandemic. Uh, explore this, and um, you could absolutely do that. So what you need is you need samples where you have not only different quark and glu gluon jet compositions, but different amount of up versus down. And so what you can do is you can look at dye jets in different regions of phase space, Z plus jet in different regions of phase space, and photon plus jet. And photons couple to up and down quarks differently than Zs couple to up and down quarks, not by a lot, but by enough that you can actually use that and do this disentangling. And so we actually studied what can happen when you, when you disentangle up versus down, and you can definitely do it. Um, and if you ask, why did we not do it for this particular paper? The reason why is that the algorithms that are needed, these, these topic modeling algorithms that are needed to separate things out, um, we only figured out how to do them when we had rock curves, which are binary classifiers. We couldn't quite figure out how to do it for multiple categories. And so that's an open research problem about how do you do this trick when you have multiple categories? Um, you can always go back to the standard kind of binned word version of, of things and, and do those methods, um, this, this method that uh, came out of University of Michigan that I mentioned. Um, but uh, we would love to be able to do this continuous version since it's much more robust. You can even get kind of reasonable uncertainties when you try to do that. Um, but yes, up versus down versus gluon, that's the next thing. Uh, and then after that, you want to separate uh, quark versus anti-quark. And, you know, this is a whole uh, little mini industry that you could do. What I really want to do is I want to use this to discover new physics. I want to say, I want to look for a, a category that I've never even thought of before. Can I search the data for a category that, that exists? That, um, uh, and it's not obvious to me whether these techniques are or are not a good idea for, for those type of anomaly detection algorithms, but it's something that we're thinking about. Okay, that's great. Looking forward to it, yeah. Okay, so why don't we uh, thank uh, Professor Thelogain? Yeah, thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much.